Uh, this is Pat McGeehan. He's a delegate from, oops. Sorry. Okay, let's start now. Now, sorry about that. That's okay. Delegate Pat McGeehan from West Virginia. This is the Catholics Against Militarism podcast. I'm Eric Morris, and Ellen has asked me to talk to Pat about um, Bring Our Troops Home, his organization, and about his life as a delegate, as a, a member of the military, and in this organization, and as a Catholic. So, uh, Pat, do you mind giving us just a first? Do you prefer to be called delegate or Pat or uh, just Pat, just Pat? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're. Uh... The lower branch of the state legislature here is called the House of Delegates. It's a traditional name from Virginia. And in most states, um, uh, it, it's just called the House of Representatives. But yeah, just, just call me Pat. My close friends call me Patty. I'm, I'm quite the uh, Irish Catholic. Oh. Patrick Riley McGeehan is my full name. So oh, okay. anyway, but yeah, Pat's fine. Great. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. So Irish Catholic. So... Are you grew up in West Virginia? Uh, actually, I didn't, Eric. I um, uh, my my father was uh, an Air Force pilot, so um, I was born in Oklahoma. He was in pilot training, and there was an Air Force base in the middle of the desert out there. Um, and uh, I spent the first six months or so of my life in Enid, Oklahoma, and then I sort of followed him around with my family. Um, he was actually killed in the line of duty when I was 14. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, he was a bomber pilot. But then uh, then we moved home to West Virginia. But both sides of my family are from uh, uh, the northern panhandle of West Virginia. Uh, and so all of my extended relatives, you know, uh, all live uh, uh, here in West Virginia still. So, yeah, so uh, I did, wasn't raised in West Virginia, but it's always, you know, been considered my home. Uh, and uh, uh, did high school here, and then uh, it's a long time ago now. I'm 40 years old now. I, I can't believe I just announced that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I uh, I went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs for college, and then um, I graduated from there. Uh, shoot, uh, 17 years ago now. And uh, I did some time, uh, uh, commissioned uh, uh, afterwards into the Air Force and did time as an intelligence officer for a few years. And I, I deployed overseas uh, to the Middle East and, uh, and to uh, Afghanistan for a little bit while I was in the service. And I got out and then, uh, you know, got into a little bit of business and then uh, came back home to West Virginia, of course, and then. You know, and then I wound up in politics somehow. So okay, well, it's pretty pretty impressive. Forty, I'm I'm just over forty myself, and so you've I, I know that you've been in the a, a delegate for quite a while now. So you've you've been in politics for for a little part time job for the people out there. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, the legislature's just part time here. Uh, yeah, this is my fourth term. There's in the lower branch here. Uh, you know, it's two uh, each term right. is two years. So, so this is my fourth term and. It gets it. It drags on you, you know. It uh, it can wear on you, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, but you know some of some of the the, the arguments and debate. Um, I I enjoy that part of it and helping constituents out, you know, talking with people. And I like that part of it too. So good, good. So there's a military background for you both. It sounds like with your father. I'm very sorry to hear about about that. And that. And you are also in the military, and you're. A, Raised Catholic, born Catholic. I would. Assume. I was. Yeah, uh, my father was a devoted Catholic. Um, uh, came from a big, like I said, uh, Irish Catholic family. Um, uh, he was one of nine, and uh, uh, my mother was actually uh, raised a um, uh, Methodist, mm -hmm. but uh, but her side of the family is uh, uh, of Irish heritage too. You know, we say we're we're Irish, but you know. We're talking four and five generations ago. Right. So, uh, but, uh, but but yeah, she uh, her uh, uh, her her grandparents were actually originally Catholic, but uh, uh, during the Great Depression, uh, uh, things got really bad, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, her her great grandparents, I should say. Uh, uh, so the only church within walking distance they didn't have a car at the time was. Uh, 
was a Methodist church, I believe. And so, wow. so uh, that's how, you know, she, uh, she was raised in the, uh, in, in that uh, denomination. But uh, when she married my father, she converted to Catholicism and that's been a long time ago. So, you know, I was born and raised a Catholic. Um, you know, I, I, I had my ups and downs with the church in my 20s. I'm sort of a cliche, like the, the prodigal son, you know. Uh, in my 20s, I, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit weird because um, uh, I don't know if this is strange and uh, sort of just uh, uh, sort of my analytical brain uh, that I come at it from this sort of direction, my faith anyway. Um, but um, I was drawn back into the church by uh, reading uh, Thomas Aquinas and some of the other scholastics actually uh, in my late 20s. And it would, I was, he made very convincing arguments and I thought, what, what am I thinking? You know, how arrogant can I can I be to think I'm I I know more than, than some of these legitimate literal geniuses that, right. that laid out the, uh, what we now uh, dedicate uh, or or base most of the Catholic Catechism on. So, well, that's impressive. Uh, how many did uh, how many books of Aquinas did you end up reading, or how much time? Uh, did you... So I read. Uh, much of the Summa Theologica, of course, that's over one and a half million words. Right. Um, well, I mean, that's, that's... Yeah, yeah. That that one is is it can get very dense. I mean, it's when you open Saint Thomas, uh, especially his major treatises, the uh, the Summa Theologica, and then you have uh, the Contra Gentili. Um, uh, you know, those are those are those are not some sort of light reading. You know, where you no. pick up like a. It, you know, you know this. You've read them probably. You've read part. Of, I've actually not read it, so I'm. I'm, I'm now, now I feel. Well, I feel well they. You're inspiring well, me now. Well, he writes in the scholastic method, where you right. know he proposes a question, and then uh, uh, he'll um, he'll go through and and uh, provide objections. Mm -hmm. And he one thing I really admire about Aquinas is that he doesn't weaken his opponent's arguments. Hmm. Matter of fact, I think in some respects, uh, and I'm not a trained theologian by any stretch of the imagination, but in some respects, I think he strengthens the opposition's arguments uh, and, and makes that, you know, sort of uh, his, 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 the opposition's arguments into a, like an ironclad, as, as ironclad as possible, and then he just takes them down, you know. Yeah. So there, there's no, there's no getting around the fact that he somehow gave a, a straw man character, character yeah. to, to to what what the opponents would say, um, and and then he would he you know. So after all these objections, he'll finally answer into what he thinks. And um, and and one thing I, I really admired about Aquinas is that he. Um, he drew on so many different sources. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just incredible when you read him. Um, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, a lot of times there's this very simplistic narrative that he reconciled faith with reason, mm -hmm. or more specifically, he reconciled Aristotelianism with the faith. Um, but it's so much more than that. I mean, he was drawing on Jewish scholars and Muslim scholars, and um, it's just it's just amazing what what he was able to do, you know. And um, um, you know, I recently uh, got into reading uh, uh, Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, um, uh, which was fascinating. I had that small little book. He wrote in uh, uh, prison in the sixth century. Uh, uh, you know, the barbarians by that time had taken over uh, the Italian peninsula, and he found himself at the wrong end of the barbarian king. And you know, he's in he's in prison, and so he uh, he writes he drafts this this dialogue between him and Lady Philosophy. And um, you know, there is uh, uh, it's very it's a beautiful book he makes great arguments the fam the famous part of the book is mm -hmm. the fifth book on uh he he you know he's he's going to be executed horribly mm -hmm. you know and it's become 
in my in my in, in my take, the Rome Roman Empire uh, collapsed because of because of militarism, you mm-hmm. know. Uh, and then the barbarians came in and and were you know pretty bar- barbaric, quote unquote. <laughs> right. And uh, so he knows he's going to be executed in a horrific way. He's executed at the end of his prison term. Um, and this, uh, uh, the, the Ostrogoths uh, had this way of torturing and then executing someone where they would tie this thick cord around the, uh, the inmate's uh, uh, skull oh. and pull tight until you know, their eyeballs burst from their sockets oh. and then they would club them. And I'm sorry for going yeah. into such detail, but he knew this was coming and he was able to pen this beautiful work and he... And he's thinking about reconciling somehow. There's a, this is a big problem for him. He's, right. he's sitting there pondering, uh, okay, if God has this um, omnipotent ability of divine foreknowledge to see the future, then how can we, it be said that we authentically have free will, right? And so, right. so he beautifully meshes this, and it's almost like the precursor to uh, Aquinas, because, you know, Aquinas cites Boethius uh, tirelessly uh, in many parts of the Summa Theologica. So, so anyway, I didn't respect that work when I, I had to write, you know, I, I had it from my college days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I have these scribbled notes in the back of the original copy I used in mm-hmm. like Western Literature 101 or something, you know, <laughs> uh-huh. you know and uh, I'm picking it up and, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even appreciate this thing, you know, so I'm reading it again. It's, it's just beautiful, but I guess you know the 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 Catholic tradition. Um, it has such a wealth of and a rich intellectual heritage mm-hmm. uh, that's so beautiful, and that I truly believe built Western civilization, which I consider really civilization. And and um, and and it it's always been. I guess there's a good segue for me going off on these tangents. You got me real excited about uh, asking me those questions. But, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 this, this beautiful, there's this segue of, I think, the, the core Catholic faith, um, when you really get down to the saints and the church doctors from Augustine, you know, we talked about Boethius a little mm-hmm. bit, uh, who's also a saint, a martyr of the faith. Before you get off of it, do you know how he got that writing out, knowing he was going to die? Did, did you catch that? That's that's a bit of a mystery. Um, I, I don't think anyone exactly knows uh, how the manuscript basically escaped uh, the uh, uh, Pavia, this this small mm-hmm. little town in northern Italy where he was was kept. No one knows exactly. Only they they just know that he was executed and the manuscript somehow survived. So there's a speculation. A yeah. There's speculation. And, and there's, there's, a, there's other primary sources that pretty much tell the same story of, of, uh, you know, you know, back up the claims that he mm-hmm. makes in the consolation. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. It, it, I always wonder that too. And I try to look for answers and apparently no one has them. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, but yeah, you know, I was just making a point that, um, I think the core Catholic faith, um, uh, one segment of it, of that core faith, is uh, that core tradition is very anti-militant. It mm-hmm. was it was Thomas Aquinas, after all, where the just war doctrine culminated. It you yeah. know Augustine had laid some some points out, some good points out, sort of in the Ciceronian tradition, but it was Thomas Aquinas who laid it all out and. And that tradition is what was taught to me at the U.S. Air Force Academy. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, but I think we've just gotten so far away from that. I don't think any uh, war that this country has engaged in since the Second World War has met uh, the criteria uh, of a just war underneath Aquinas's just war theory. So. Uh, that's sad, you know. So, oh, yeah. anyway, I, I I I agree. I mean, it's 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 it doesn't meet the criteria of just war. They don't really, to me, meet the the constitutional requirements, the, the legal requirements. Um, 
So at the Air Force Academy, so I, I was a military officer. We learned just where I was a, a, a JAG at the end of my military career. So we, are, <laughs> we learned this stuff. Um, but we, I don't think we ever really applied it. I didn't start applying it personally until late in my military career. Uh, when did you, at the Air Force Academy, I didn't go to the academy. I did officer candidate school. At the Air Force Academy, did you ever, did, did a professor ever come to that conclusion with you that maybe we have not met this just war theory in the most recent engagements or? Quite the opposite. Um, you know, I, I have, uh, I actually have the textbook from, uh, I don't remember the name of the class. It was, it was, it was something on uh, international relations having to do with foreign policy because I, I was, uh, 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 9-11 happened my junior year out oh. there in Colorado. So for the first couple years, when I graduated high school in the late 90s and then and then went to school out there in Colorado, you know, we were, quote, unquote, in a, uh, in, at peace, but we were in a weird spot where the Cold War had ended and now we were like the lone superpower. And now there was all these, well, there were just basically different, flavors of neocons <laughs> jockeying to get their their what what their vision and their policy uh should uh, uh, uh you know get imposed uh, mm -hmm. get accepted anyway going forward and and uh uh there was a textbooks called uh, i have it it's called uh, uh america's strategic choices or something in the 21st century or something like that mm -hmm. so i i you know broke it out I, I found it i broke it out not too terribly long ago. And all of them, all the chapters are written by different professors, mm -hmm. you know, political scientists, the, the guys that society has deemed worthy of, uh, of, of telling us all what we should believe. And uh, uh, so, you know, they want, you know, there's these big essays uh, dedicated to global engagement, mm -hmm. selective engagement, you know, exterminating you know, government regime change. You know, I mean, I'm 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 using hyperbole. That's not the right. language they use. They right. use the technocratic stuff. But um, uh, uh, the the one the one chapter. It was I think it was at the very end. It's very small, and it's almost like they picked guys specifically who didn't believe in uh, what I would refer to as non-intervention mm -hmm. uh, uh, to to write it. Uh, like like in a weakened state in sort right. of lock it, and uh, and it was it, and of course they call it isolationism. Right. And uh, we'll just which is opposite of what, what you just described in the Summa Theologica, where he builds up. He doesn't create the straw man, Aquinas. Right. Right. Exactly. They 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 did the straw man, and <laughs> and, and and so they you know they they. Uh, uh, did the exact opposite, and then they uh, spent the majority of that short chapter uh, explaining why that was wrongheaded and foolish, you know. And so I look back and I thought, oh my goodness, you know. Yeah. But I was always, I was always sort of the guy that, and I wasn't a great student at the time. I didn't really appreciate what I had in front of me in terms of higher education. Um, but I still, in some of those classes, I always was always the person that thought, you know, I want to make, you know, I don't like just going along with the collective group think. I always had this natural aversion to, you know, it sent chills down my spine of going along with what everyone thinks in this group. Like, maybe there's something wrong with that. I don't inherently. But anyway, so I always change. So most of the guys there were, you know, pretty gun ho And so it was always, so let's go bomb them and shoot mm -hmm. first and ask questions later. And so I'd always be the person saying, well, if we're given orders to bomb uh, uh, certain targets, why would we follow them? You know, why, why would we do this? And then everyone would look at me like, you know, what, what are you, an idiot? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sort of just simplifying things. But, you know, there would be different classes where I'd always play the devil's advocate. And it was always more of a, I don't, I just don't know if this is uh, uh, the uh, the right way to go, the gun ho way to go. But. Really, my time overseas, which wasn't very extensive, it was only six months in Qatar and uh, in Afghanistan, sort of split back and forth. Um, it had a pretty big effect on on uh, firming up my views on 
our foreign policy and how wrong-headed we, uh, we've, we've come to be, I guess. Oh, when you were playing the devil's advocate or in, in, at college, did you ever raise these with the professor himself or herself? And did they ever engage you in a, or was this just amongst fellow cadets? Usually it was, uh, it was, it was among the, uh, the other guy, the other cadets in mm -hmm. the class. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it rarely ever was, uh, uh, with, um, uh, the actual professors, mm -hmm. um, uh, some of these classes, some of the professors, I think, would just like to observe the debate and they would sort of pose questions to facilitate the discussion mm -hmm. in debates, but they wouldn't, they, to their credit, a lot of times they wouldn't steer it. Mm -hmm. I only had a few that would do the opposite. And, uh, you know, I remember one lieutenant colonel who was a professor in uh, one of my classes on and, uh I think it was the history of the Korean and Vietnam Wars, I think. And he was, he definitely did not like me. And, uh, uh, you know, and so I had, you know, he, he definitely was a gun ho. Mm -hmm. If only we would have done X, Y, and Z, we would have declared victory and won Vietnam and, and all this stuff. And I always sort of brought up the opposite point, you know, like, yeah. I don't, I don't know about that, but anyway, yeah. So, but a lot of times in those humanity departments, it was usually a, you know, a, a, a back and forth between mm -hmm. kids. So, yeah, you know, but I'm, I'm going on memory now. It's all right. No, I, I understand. <laughs> two decades. I'm, I'm trying to feel how much academic, academic freedom, I guess there is in the academy system. Oh yeah. I got you. Yeah. Did, did you attend? I, uh, did you attend church regularly at, at the academy? I, uh, uh, no, you, I didn't. Uh, do you know if, if the Catholic chaplain ever spoke about issues like just war or anything? Did you ever catch me? I don't think so. I mean, I, I went to mass while I was there, but I mean, I have to admit, I was just, when I, you know, uh, uh, I, I wasn't a, a good Catholic there. <laughs> and so I, you know, uh, I still went to mass periodically. It's just, uh, you know, I feel you make me feel really guilty now. <laughs> no, no, that's not. Well, I, I, I did it. I, I, I did I've it. never I, during my time in service, I never came across a Catholic chaplain that really spoke about just war while I was in the midst of war or anything. So I, I was. Have you ever come across a Catholic chaplain? I guess that. That's a good. That's an interesting uh, point. Yeah, I, I don't. Devoted chaplains, but I never really had one that was really talking about kind of the things that I, now I'm concerned about. So, right, right, yeah. You know, I don't re I don't recall any of the chaplains ever, uh, any of the Catholic priests ever, uh, uh, chaplains ever saying anything about just war. Um, you know, but uh, I probably when I was in mass at the uh, they made the Catholics go to mass in the basement at the. Uh, Air Force Academy, and we always had this joke that uh, it was because the Protestants had to be a little bit closer to heaven, oh. and uh, it, you know it's it's a joke. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but uh, uh, yeah, but I probably wasn't paying full attention to some of the homilies, so it could have come up. But so it's, so during your time, your deployment in Qatar and, 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 and Afghanistan, so you said your views started coalescing or, or strengthening, I guess. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, I was an intelligence guy, so when I deployed, uh, uh, we went to Qatar first, and um, uh, and so when I, when I remember distinctly, this was in 2005, so the Iraq war was, was, was pretty well underway, and uh, uh, the, the Combined Air Operations Center was in Qatar, so the the uh, the senior ranking Air Force general. That's where he he was sort of located, and uh, so the air war was sort of run out of Al mm -hmm. Udeid Air Base in Qatar. And so I found out I was going to be the the general's uh, uh, intelligence briefer as soon as we landed. Some uh, some some uh, airman. Uh, I was getting off the tar uh, plane, and I was you know right in the Persian Gulf there near Doha, and you know. Ooh. it's 
it's not cool. We'll just put it that way yeah. as far as the weather goes. I mean, it was like, whoa, okay, this is different. And then uh, this airman drives up in a blue truck and is yelling my name out, and I'm just a lieutenant at the time, and he says, you're going to be briefing the general at, you know, oh, 900 tomorrow morning on the situation in Iraq and Afghanistan. Oh, <laughs> and wow. I'm like, you know, something like that. I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I didn't, no one told me about this. Well, I, I was supposed to be doing something else when I showed up, you oh, know, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm like, well, what happened to the last guy? And like, you know, he's no longer <laughs> in that role. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm like, well, he got fired. I'm like, oh, all right, that's great. So anyway, you know, I had to learn pretty quick, get spit, spit up. But, you know, I guess the point of me bringing that out is when I took a rook around a tarmac, it's steaming hot. The humidity is about 100% because it's real close to the Persian Gulf. There's nothing but desert. And all of these uh, uh, heavy cargo planes, C-17, C-130s, they're, they're just landing, take it off unloading cargo constantly it would look like the berlin airlift I mean, mm -hmm. you know i knew what that actually looked like and uh i just my first thought in my head was what an utter waste of resources <laughs> that's the first thought that came <laughs> into my head i mean you know and I, I wasn't any sort of uh i didn't have any specific worldview at the time i was only like 25 years old and 24 something like that and uh, but that was the first thought that went through my head. And then another thing I noticed is that when you're overseas, um, they have the armed forces network that's constantly playing on TVs that are in tents and in your bunk or whatever. And it's, sure. it's basically, you know, for the coalition guys, there was cricket like the Aussies and the, uh, um, the, the Brits, you had cricket on, and I hate cricket. You know, there's no baseball from what I remember. But the other thing was there was constant, like, commercials. Hmm. But it was like, uh, this is brought to you by you – know, this, this, is, this is commercials brought to you by um, the soldiers that landed at D-Day at Omaha Beach on oh, June 6, 1944. The GIs, you know, hit the, the, the dog red sector. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm like – you know, we were riding from where our barracks were one time in, in the bus. And I was riding next to a buddy of mine mm -hmm. um, who we're still close to. Friend, uh, I'm still close to this guy. Uh, he's out of the service too now. And uh, uh, we were riding one time, uh, you know, sharing a bus seat. And I'm looking at, you know, one of these darn stupid uh, uh, ads, mm -hmm. a TV in front of me. And I, and I, I remember turning to him, and he, he he recounts this story first, and then I remembered it. And he goes, he turned to me and he said, uh, you know, this is just a bunch of utter propaganda BS, you know. And, and I'm like, why do they keep showing us this, you know? And, and then he he would he keeps telling me this story, and I and I recall it, and and so it did feel like mm -hmm. there was this constant barrage of. We're the good guys, mm -hmm. you know. We're Captain America. We're we're good. They're evil, and it was just shoved down your throat constantly, and it felt so insincere and disingenuous. And, wow. You know. Anyway. No. So, and from there it got worse. You know, I you know I I went to Bagram Air Base for a little bit, and mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of the drone mm -hmm. strikes. Uh, the predator strikes, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, a lot of that stuff that was in real time when mm -hmm. you're you're talking about intelligence and then constantly reporting on you know casualties and mm -hmm. uh, you st a lot of thoughts start creeping in your head like you know why are we here? You know, yeah. what, what I thought we were supposed to be looking for the guys that uh, the 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 to be so uh, to be a simpleton the bad guys right. right. Um, you know, that did X, Y, and Z. And, and, and the only criminals that perpetrated the atrocities of 9-11, the Al-Qaeda network um, headed up by Osama bin Laden, they didn't want any reporting on. I remember trying to dig into that. I, I huh. eventually became head of the Afghanistan desk. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, and, and they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't care for 
uh, you know, you know, it was always like, well, the mission's changed now. We're like, well, what do you mean? Like, well, we're, you know, we're, we're going after these guys and, you know, we're trying to build a democracy in Afghanistan and in the, in the Middle East and in Iraq. And anyway, I don't want to go on and on, but basically, you know, there's some other more specific incidents that were tragic that really started making me think even more, but but yeah, after all of that, I really started to question uh, American foreign policy in general, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially when I found out that the uh, the weapons of mass destruction, uh, uh, you know, narrative was mm -hmm. was completely false. Right. So. How did how did the the recent Afghanistan papers report affect you as an Afghanistan veteran? It's almost like. You know, I mean, it's it's it wasn't anything new. It was just sure. sort of, like, you know, I guess the uh, the 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 reaction from the public has been just almost indifference. Right. And it's sort of strange, and and maybe that's because a large percentage of the public kind of knew that you know everything was sort of a lie, and um, but I think I think. I might be a little bit more cynical in thinking that, you know, uh, a large part of the public just doesn't care too much yeah. about, you know, foreign policy. And and there's, I think, maybe reasons why, you know, don't care. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's it's utterly ridiculous to me to think that all of these gentlemen who were uh, very high-ranking officials were intentionally deceiving the public for so long um, and then giving these interviews explicitly stating that they were lying. Uh, that's, I guess, I think maybe the most shocking, right. that part, that piece of it, you know, that there's a difference between being ignorant, you know, and and wishful think having wishful thinking that maybe if we just stick around a little bit longer it'll work out like i wanted it to work out but you know when you know that it's not going to work out that the objective is impossible uh and uh uh and 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 you know it's sticking around is going to lead to more expense and more lives lost mm -hmm. and then you go out and you t say the opposite Sometimes I do feel like maybe there's a special place in hell for people like that. But, you know, that's for I, God to decide. So. Of course. I, my understanding, I think Stanley McChrystal, General McChrystal, and uh, General Peter Pace, the former chairman of Joint Chiefs, are, I think they're both supposedly, I've read, uh, devoted Catholics. And so uh, to be part of this narrative, which, what, yeah, what's, that's what's probably most disturbing about this particular leak or whatever is that the they're actually lying and they're they're hiding the lies and I, I, and it bothers me as a catholic I, if that these men were in these positions and did they that they use that faith summa theologica and that they still act like that so i guess maybe do you mind kind of talking about maybe your catholic faith and faith and how it's affected your decisions after that i guess uh, well, I agree with you for one on Stanley McChrystal and, um, you know, I think Petraeus was definitely involved in that. I don't know what his background is as far as his religious. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know his religion. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I didn't know that Crystal was a Catholic, but, uh, there's, there's, uh, you know, I mean, it goes back to, uh, I think, I think there's a lot of. You know, uh, we call them C and E's, Christmas and Easter Catholics, mm -hmm. who go through the motions. Right. And uh, and I'm not, I don't really mean to imply that that that's what he is, right. the crystal. But but if you're not, I guess, if you're if you're if you're willing to go to those types of lengths in your deception, and with the stakes being that high. Um, you know, they're they're you're definitely I, in my mind. You, you can't be just showing up and and uh, 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 you can't claim to be an actual legitimate Catholic in my mind. You know, you know, it's like I, I get this the the argument that um, 
there's this argument out there that uh, uh, atheists bring up, and they they you know it's it's a foolish argument, but I've heard it brought up by the the, the new atheists, you know, the militant atheists that uh, uh, of course they always go off on the tangent that religion uh, is the cause of violence, and uh, uh, well they go off on the uh, uh, they go off on the tangent that uh, uh, you know uh, Hitler was you know they imply that Hitler was some sort of good Catholic boy taking communion on Sunday you know because you know the the Hitler youth and the Third Reich and the and the uh, Wehrmacht and uh, uh, the SS had religious insignia Christian insignia on it you know uh, God's with us and you know they hit you know and and it's ridiculous because uh, I can almost I can guarantee to you that uh, just like their Soviet counterparts at the time who were explicitly atheist, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the men that orchestrated the final solution j believed adamantly that there was no power higher than their own. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, to to sit there and say. Anything to the contrary, I think, is is absurd. Um, so, you know, I guess getting back to your point, you have, we do have a very watered down form of Christianity and Catholicism, for that matter, um, in the United States and I think internationally, where, you know, we've gotten away from teaching hard truths, mm -hmm. you know, um, because we've just succumb to this well sort of do what you want we can go with the conventions of the time you know and and and, and there's this this our society is becoming a, more and more a, a secular sort of nation now and i think the church is is not to get too far off topic but it's been on my mind the church is is i think losing membership because of some of the scandals but also because they're not really teaching you mm -hmm. any hard and fast rules per se that you must that must follow. You know, in, in let's just call it moral life. It's sort of a watered down, you know, just be a nice person. Mm -hmm. And if that's the message, then why attend mass? Why go to hear the priest? So, um, you know, and I and I think uh, that also has become one reason why uh, I think I think the move towards secularism in my opinion um, is 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 one component for the cause of our society being uh, turning into this sort of militant type of society because I, I don't think that you could uh, uh, the ethics that we'll say Western civilization but here in the United States, um, I think we're, we're really the epitome of Western civilization. So we'll just say here in the United States, the more and more you become secular, you're losing the roots of what gave you those strong ethics to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure if you can divorce yourself from the roots and the cause of those strong ethics and somehow still maintain those ethics. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why you're seeing... Uh, one symptom is, uh, you know, in my opinion, uh, uh, the public is just, uh, uh, you know, do whatever you feel like, almost this quasi light hedonistic type uh, lifestyles. And, you know, and then you have the bread and circuses, quote unquote, uh, you know, in the, so, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've just been thinking a lot about those things. And, you know, and so when you have leaders like that, like, like a McChrystal, Mm -hmm. Who just, you know, believe that they can just tell other lies when the stakes mm -hmm. were that high, you know. I mean, you know, and, and these guys, mind you, might he's Catholic, but also, um, uh, you know, you know, in the military, you you know this, your bread. There's this sort of, you know, like Spartan like honor that's mm -hmm. you know supposedly there, you know, right. that goes back, you know, that's that's ingrained in you, you know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even really matter what branch you're in. It's there, you know. We take pride, you know. We have loyalty, honor, you know. 
almost like the Jack Nicholson character from A Few Good Men. You know, we <laughs> use words like honor, code, loyalty, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you have those convictions, but, you know, we've gotten away from all of that. That was all, you know, on some sort of uh, Western ethical tradition rooted, I believe, in, in, in the Christian faith. We've divorced ourselves from that, and now what do we have? Well, we just have... Uh, you, we've lost our bearing, you know. Mm -hmm. I, not not to not to be too long winded here, but that wraps into one point that, you know, when I said that in my twenties I was reading Aquinas and I it sort of kind of brought me back. You know, I was reading uh, Aquinas's uh, Five Proofs uh, for for the existence of God and the argument from causality and the argument uh, uh, you know from contingency really struck a chord with me and. Uh, you know, but but now fast forward, you know, that was you know, 12, a dozen years ago. Uh, the most beautiful uh, proof, I guess you could say, is, is uh, Augustine's sort of, I think, favorite proof, which was the, um, you know, these, there's eternal truths in the world, you know, and we can recognize, you know, truth, some sort of perfect truth. It's mm -hmm perfect because it can't be contradicted and I always like to use the the triangle as uh, as the example you know we can we can envision a triangle uh, it's it you know it has three interior angles that add up to 180 degrees we can't alter that truth no matter how mm -hmm. much we want we can't imagine uh, you know a triangle being anything other than uh, you know, uh, 180 degrees, the sum of its uh, angle or whatever. And, and so it's somehow superior to our minds. It's unalterable. It, it mm -hmm. cannot change. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, um, you know, and that was his, his sort of uh, uh, a way of, of knowing that that, that uh, eternal truth has to come from somewhere. The, mm -hmm. the cause... Uh, uh, the effect has to be commensurate with the cause and mm -hmm. can't come from our minds. Right. You know, uh, uh, so, so anyway, so there's this certain truth and that, that is the, the, uh, the, the truth the creator is given for us to objectively evaluate everything else in the materialistic world from, to measure from the standard truth that's there. We can't alter it. It, it doesn't change like we can change our minds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's, 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 you know, it's this, um, you know, this, this idea of perfect eternal truth that lives on even as our minds perish. Um, and, and ultimately it comes from the creator. And uh, uh, once you, you know, it's just such a beautiful thing once you start really getting into the finer details and it takes a while for you to square your head with some of it, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's uh that I think uh, you know uh, we've gotten away from that, even in the Catholic Church, uh, where there are certain moral truths as well, mm -hmm. and we've gotten I think into moral relativ mm -hmm. uh, moral re relativity and uh, uh, and away from uh, you, know, you know what the Church Fathers always taught, uh, you know, uh, deducted from the Gospel. So mm -hmm. anyway, so I, I'm on your. The bring the bring our troops home. Have you filed your bill at the West Virginia legislature yet, or do you plan to? Yo, yeah, yeah, I, I yes, I did. I uh, uh, so so I've the Defend the Guard Act is what you're referring to. Yeah, yes. I filed it. Um, Maybe explain a, a little. Yesterday. Right, okay. it was introduced yesterday. Um, so this is the. Um, so I've done that. Uh, f I've introduced that bill for six consecutive years now. But oh. yeah. So um, so for anybody out there that doesn't know what the Defend the Guard Act is, um, it's it's I think a very um, good i positive idea. I think it's a unique idea, and I think it really has potential. You know, um, uh, I sort I sort of was looking for a decentralized method to. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, force accountability on Washington D.C. about uh, the warfare state, and uh, uh, was coordinating at first with the Tenth Amendment Center, um, and and those guys are great out there. And uh, so I introduced it the first time in 2015. So the bill, uh, 
just to really simplify it, all it says is that the U.S. Congress has to take a vote uh, uh, and, and pass an official declaration of war before they can send um, our own boys and girls in our uh, state uh, mm-hmm. guard units into combat overseas. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I think that's a very good thing. The executive branch has grown uh, grown way, way too powerful. Um, it doesn't really matter who the president is uh, anymore. The precedent has sort of even been somewhat uh, established that the president does not even need authorization from the Congress mm-hmm. at all before, you know, our boys and girls are just uh, sent into war overseas into foreign nations. So... Uh, that essentially, I think, throws out the uh, the Constitution sort of entirely because mm-hmm. um, if you go back and read the Founding Fathers, uh, one of the biggest fears they had uh, was not just going to war too frequently. Mm-hmm. It was... It was a fear of just having standing armies to begin with. Right. So... You know, if you go and read the uh, uh, the thoughts on guys like Madison and uh, you know, Patrick Henry, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, certainly, you know, all of these guys, um, they certainly just, I mean, they don't even really have to go too much into that the Congress, the question of war is vested in the Congress right. alone. Because that was ultimately just taken for granted because— right. Uh, if you actually, I was reading the uh, Philadelphia some some uh, points uh, that were made at the Philadelphia Convention when they were uh, debating, you know, the how to write the Constitution, and uh, uh, I don't remember the gentleman's name that proposed this escapes me right now, but essentially one guy at the convention proposed that the president uh, have authority to uh, take the country to war. And he was basically scorned and laughed, you know, off the stage, so to speak, like because every and one guy, you know, wrote where he said, I can't believe someone actually had the audacity to suggest in a republic Mm -hmm. that the executive be the branch to to take the country to war. It would be a disaster. So it was it was just taken for granted. And the one thing was there was all these other checks that I don't think the, the, the those that generation, that founding generation, could ever have foreseen that those checks would would break down. The, the other checks were um, okay. Every two years, if there is a standing army, every two years it has to expire. Right. Otherwise, if you, you'd have to authorize more funding, and then it was uh, uh, you know the local militias. Mm-hmm. That was a decentralized local militia defense force was all that was necessary for the new country's defense. Mm -hmm. And there was no need of a standing army. But if you did have a standing army Mm -hmm. um, for some sort of extraordinary circumstance, uh, you know, there was a hard break of two years and there was the power of the purse there. And uh, those two mechanisms were really the biggest breaks from having a militant type society. And, uh, I don't think the founding fathers could have ever envisioned that those would just become non-issues. They would just become, you know, it would be just routine that, you know, every two years, obviously, they're going to pass that National Defense Authorization Act. It's just a question of whether it's going to be $800 billion this year or $798 billion. You know? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you have the, uh, uh, you know, the, I mean, the local the militias have all been nationalized mm-hmm. uh, and they're you know, taking control of the National Guard. And that's really where our this bill comes into play is that it, it uses that uh, federalist structure that was mm-hmm. originally relied on along with the fact that only the Congress has the power of war uh, to try to fight back. And, um, you know, I haven't been successful here in West Virginia. Has it been uh, put up for a vote, at least? I, the most success, really, that I've had here was this past year, last uh, the last session we had here in 2019. I did force a vote and was successful with this, you know, 
sort of inside baseball, but uh, a parliamentary, parliamentary maneuver where you make a motion to discharge the bill from committee because they're, they're never going to put it on the agenda. Right. And, you know, I got a majority of votes to take the, the, the bill up right there on the House floor. Uh, but it was a short lived victory because the, the, the Speaker of the House is a uh, uh, rules committee killed it the next day. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, uh, the rules of the House are kind of screwy here. It would take two thirds, a two thirds supermajority vote to get it out of the rules committee now. So, uh, so you know, but, but, you know, it made a lot of uh, news and we got to talk about the concept. And, and actually, you know, that kind of brings us to, to, to the group you're talking about, the coalition you're talking about, uh, came together uh, over this past summer. And it was um, some guys out west that mm -hmm. I got to know. Dan McKnight, he's from Idaho. He's a he's a veteran, a very honorable man, great guy. Uh, Tyler Lindholm, he's a state representative from uh, uh, Wyoming. He's a, another very good guy. I mean, if you meet him, he's kind of a character. He's uh, kind of uh, you know, I, I I like him. He's he just he's just he, you know kind of my kind of guy. He's just Tall, lanky guy, got a big cowboy hat on. I mean, I, I didn't know they still made cowboys, man, but I'm glad they do, you know? And, uh, so uh, I was in the Wyoming National Guard, so I know what you're talking about. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, you're bringing up yeah. uh, I feel like I some... don't know him without, without, without knowing him. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so he, you know, they're great, and they're really taking the ball and running with it. And then there's some other guys that are that that are really coordinating things. And so right now we're pretty optimistic that um, we'll, we may have over 20 different states introduce that legislation uh, either this month or next month. And uh, so to go from one mm -hmm. to you know over 20. It's shocking to me, and I think it really reflects that you know there's op there's reasons right. to be optimistic, and even if they you can't get them passed in the mm -hmm. majority of the states, even if you just get one state to pass it, uh, it sends a message. And just the fact that that many states have different reps introducing right. that bill sends a strong message. I think so. Uh, you know, I, I was researching in Iraq at the height of the Iraq War. Uh, I think it was military, uh, the military times, according to the military's own stats, uh, 40, something like 45% of the combat brigades in Iraq around 2007, 2008, during that surge time frame, um, were national guard units. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so, so if now, we can, yeah. yeah, I mean, so if we can send a message and, and say we'll threaten to withhold the state's guard mm -hmm. units and bring them back and keep them under state control because you guys have not done your due diligence and passed a declaration of war like you're mandated to, mm -hmm. then maybe we can really make a difference. So we'll see. I think it's worth pursuing. Do you have any other co-sponsors on, on the delegate side with you? Oh, yes. Um, uh, uh, I think right now nine other sponsors, um, and uh, we're only allowed, I think eleven total, twelve total, counting myself. So I, I, I think I'll go out and get a couple more. And it's bipartisan. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know half Democrats, half Republicans, and that was my next question. And and what about on the Senate side? Any luck getting anybody? Unfortunately, uh, not here in West Virginia. Um, I think I'm, I'm optimistic that we can get it out of the house. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not very optimistic that we can get it out of the Senate. Uh, we have an adjutant general of the National Guard here that's adamantly opposed to the bill. He seems to love to uh, take uh, our different National Guard units and deploy mm -hmm. with them overseas to to, to who knows where. I mean, they go into uh, Iraq, the Middle East. You know, uh, we just had a uh, report that over a thousand West Virginia National Guard troops are over in the Middle East right now. Um, and uh, 
you know, I mean, they get paid for this. They get more money for this. You know, the, the guard units themselves, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, I don't know some of the mechanisms that go into it, but I know the one big reason why uh, he's against it is uh, uh, he doesn't have talk with me anymore because uh, <laughs> I know it's better. But, but I think, you know, it's just this, uh, but we get federal subsidies, you mm-hmm. know, and right. what happens if they turn the spigot off and, you know, and that's one reason why the coalition is important, because it's very difficult for the federal government to turn the spigot off of to 18 or 19 states. They could they could pick on, you know, one state like West, little West Virginia here. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's harder when you have a big, broad uh, strength in numbers. There's one, one thing you might want to look at is uh, if the adjutant general goes to visit the troops, see if he's visiting at the end of the month and the beginning of the month, because if you're in combat zone for one day your pay is then considered um tax free for that month so that's something you might want to check out there because often really? the tag where somebody would visit or the, the the higher ranking guard members would visit the 30th and the first of the month so they could kind of have two months tax free so that's something you might want to look at there yeah i will that's that's i don't know if that's still the case it's been 10 years since i've been in the, the guard I'll look into that. That's that's an intriguing point. Yeah, I'll look into that. And see if, huh? So speaking of coalitions, um, you know the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. You know that that group the, of of all the bishops, their lobby group up in DC. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm familiar. I'm it, broadly familiar. Yeah. It, it, how many bishops are in West Virginia? How many? We have one diocese, the Willie Charleston Diocese. It's a very small diocese. Yeah, and do, is there a lobbyist that represents the, the bishop at the state house? You know, well, there's a uh, a, a lobbyist that's in charge of Catholic charities. That's usually lobbies uh, uh, for that organization, and he's he was presumably always the bishop's kind of right hand guy. Um, but I don't know if there's any representative from the organization that you were referring to. So the yeah the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops here in Indiana we have five bishops across the, the state. So they they all have gotten together and they have the Indiana Catholic Conference, and they have a lobbyist that represents them at the state house. And I'll, so I'm trying to see if the bishop or the Catholic hierarchy in in West Virginia has shown any interest in in your stand against militarism your stand for decentralization are you getting any support from the church i guess from the, the local parish to to the bishop to anything like that unfortunately not um the the and i'm sad to say this but the diocese in the very top of the hierarchy here in west virginia has been through a lot mm-hmm. and there's uh, a big scandal that unfolded in the wake of uh, the McCarrick scandal from D.C. Oh. Um, Bishop Bransfield was sort of, a, I guess, ally of McCarrick, and his name mm-hmm. was implicated in the investigation there. And then that led to one thing to another, and then it turns out that, uh, uh, you know, the bishop here uh, was— uh, uh, I mean, unbelievable things, you know, mm-hmm. sexual abuse, um, uh, you, uh, uh, perpetual or um, uh, constant use and abuse of prescription drugs and alcohol. He's, he uh, just a report just came out by the Vatican um, that uh, said that he in his 12 years as bishop, uh, he um, he spent uh, some $180 million over and above what the uh, diocese actually took in. And he just went on, he spent $6 million on his own home renovation. Uh, So, um, you know, he's no longer the bishop. Um, So we're, uh, I think we just got a new bishop and I I cannot remember the gentleman's name. Um, So hopefully that turns around. But there has been, in my opinion, less of an interest in the bishop's, you know, sort of entourage. Um, because, quite honestly, I think that they were more concerned with um, some of the uh, 
they corrupted themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, uh, several of the Monsignors around the bishop were also forced to, they are disgraced because they knew it was all going on. Yeah. They were sort of a part of it and uh, condoning it and taking part of it because they were receiving benefits from it, you know, in terms of uh, monetary uh, uh, gifts. And, uh, and, so, and so, you know, I don't think that, and I, I, I you know, I, it's it's those kind of things that are really destroying the church too from the inside. But uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think they were uh, in any position to really uh, uh, go out and, and do God's work in terms of public policy. So okay, I was, I was wondering if right if, or if, if, if in these other states, the other nineteen states, twenty states that that might be able to propose or are pr- potentially proposing this type of bill, if they're bishops or the bishop lobbyists could could show support for for just war theory and get behind and and it's also kind of a subsidiarity or argument too that the guard is represents the 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 home the, the smaller entities and it doesn't need to be nationalized so there's there are moral arguments for your bill in, in the catholic faith right it might be good to have some bishop somewhere some some strong priest to help out in this uh, mission. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I've never thought about that, to tell you the truth. So, yeah, I know I, come, a couple of priests come to mind. I might give them a call. Okay, okay. okay. Well, well maybe, maybe we'll leave on that, that positive note. And um, right. I truly appreciate it. I, you're, you've, uh, hopefully, people who watch this will think to, to get into the Summa Theologica. I'm going to actually probably jump into this now. So, you it's, it's yeah. I would I would I would uh, if you jump into it I would uh, read the pieces that you're that interest you the most at first. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, rather than you know reading it chronologically, okay. you know, because uh, you it, it, it can be disheartening when you do that. But <laughs> it was for me, unless you're different than I am. I so yeah, you read the pieces that interest you the most. You know, I was I was. Certainly interested in, in just war peace, and I was interested in his, his his proofs. Those are the most famous, and then kind of getting into uh, uh, the nature of God and uh, and what is happiness and uh, and uh, and things of that nature. But yeah, I mean, he's it's it's very it's very uh, 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 refreshing to. I always get energized by contemplating some of the things that Aquinas. And, and written and speaking of which I'll uh you can see this uh, I'll show you my oh, I see wall. Jesus on the, the wall there uh let's see heart of this. oh let's see uh, can you see some of those pictures oh those are the beautiful people. yeah oh there's yeah. uh there's there's Aquinas that's the famous yep painting over in Rome his triumph over Plato and uh Aristotle <laughs> and then over here uh, let's see what I'm I can't see the little box. Yeah, it's kind of hard to it's, you know, raise it up there. You know. Is that it? Yeah, that, yeah that's uh, that. my mother actually bought me that for Christmas. That's oh. another famous painting, Renaissance painting. That's uh, 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 over in Rome on the ceiling of uh, one of the chapels. I can't remember what chapel it is, close to the Vatican. That's, uh, that's, a, that's Thomas uh, presenting his work to the church oh. with, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, with the Holy Spirit there above. And then that uh, figure at the bottom, that's Aristotle just sort of hanging, you know, uh, holding out his, uh, his logic or whatever. And, and he's sort of lowly in the picture, you know, so. That's uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, so that's, they keep me company down here. Actually, <laughs> I inherited the, uh, the picture of the Christ there from, uh, from my, my former priest in my parish that passed away. So, yeah. So. Well, awesome. Well, it's really Truly appreciate the time, and um, yeah, I've had uh, I enjoyed the conversation. Me so, too. Thank you. Fascinating. I'm going to stop recording now. All right, all right, Eric. God bless. Thank you very much.